Join Wondery Plus to listen to American Innovations one week early and ad-free in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. It's March 9th, 2016, Brooklyn, New York. Hillary Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta weaves his way through a maze of cubicles in the campaign headquarters as his assistant struggles to keep up. Podesta is 67 years old with close-cropped gray hair and hollow cheeks, and he's not having a good day. The night before, Clinton lost the Michigan primary to Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders in a giant upset. Get the latest poll numbers from Florida to the candidate, please. And where are the polls from North Carolina? They were supposed to be on my desk this morning. I have a call in about the North Carolina polls. Also, you got an email from Gmail security. Someone was trying to access your account from the Ukraine. They suggest you change your password immediately. Do you want me to take care of that? Podesta slows down, thinking. There have been reports that Russia has been interfering with the election. So it's plausible that someone really did try to access his account. On the other hand, this could be a scam. Uh, forward it to our IT staff. Have them check it out first. Copy that. Podesta reaches the center of the room. All right, everyone, listen up. Obviously, last night was a disappointment. The candidate's not happy. I'm not happy. I know you're not happy. But we don't have time to dwell. Look, within the next week or two, you know who will clinch the Republican nomination. I don't have to tell you what his presidency would mean to this country. But to beat him, we need to win the nomination. America is counting on us. So let's put it all on the line. You got it? Got Got it. it. All right, let's get back to work. As Podesta turns to head back to his office, his assistant flags him down. I heard back from IT. They say that email is real and you should change your password as soon as possible. Podesta nods. Okay, thanks. I'll take care of it. Back in his office, Podesta opens the email sent to him from no reply at accounts.googlemail.com and clicks the link to reset his password. He types in his new password and thinks nothing further of it. But the email from accounts.googlemail.com was not legitimate. It was a so-called phishing scheme sent by a Russian espionage group believed to be associated with the Russian military. Seven months later, mere weeks before the presidential election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, the contents of Podesta's email account show up on the website WikiLeaks, embarrassing Clinton and giving Trump a huge boost at a crucial point in the campaign. The hack of Podesta's email goes down as one of the most famous hacks in American history. It becomes a focus in the Mueller investigation a year later and adds to growing public doubt about the security of American elections. And it all started with one of the oldest and simplest tricks in the computer hacker's playbook, stealing a password. From Wondery, I'm Stephen Johnson, and this is American Innovations. Today, the term hacker is synonymous with computer criminal. But when the word was first coined by MIT students in the 1960s, there was nothing innately criminal about it. Back then, hacking could be used to describe a wide range of ingenious feats, from a well-executed prank to a beautifully constructed run of model train track. Eventually, the term was applied to computers. Hacking became about pulling off cool programming tricks and figuring out all the possibilities of these amazing new machines. But as the world's relationship to computers changed, so did its view of hackers. As more and more of our life took place online, the stakes for poking around in the digital world got higher. Computers weren't just ones and zeros, but people's personal finances, documents, and secrets. Today, we're all too familiar with the alerts we get from Facebook or Gmail that an unauthorized person is trying to access our accounts. Or when Target or Home Depot reports a security breach involving millions of customers' credit cards. 
For many who pioneered it, hacking was a game, a puzzle to solve. How secure of a system could you break into? But to the companies that relied on those systems, this game became not only invasive, but a massive threat to their bottom lines. This is the story of hackers and how they morphed from geeky pranksters in the 1960s to public enemy number one in the 1990s and eventually into today's ransomware criminals and state-sanctioned cyber terrorists. It's the story of relentless innovators who pushed the boundaries of technology and the law and helped to shape the digital landscape we live in today. A key tenet of the original hacker ethos was a desire to understand and manipulate systems. Not just computer systems, but all systems, from TV signals to train schedules. And in the 1960s, the most complex and powerful system in the world was the telephone system. This is episode one, What's in the Blue Box? It's September 1960. In the musty basement of his dorm building at Washington State University, 18-year-old Ralph Barclay watches while a fellow freshman attempts to pick the lock to a closet. But this isn't just any closet. Behind this locked door are the wiring and connections for their building's entire phone system. Half their hallmates are down here with them. If Barclay does his job correctly, he'll secure free long-distance calls for all of them. One of the guys behind Barclay pushes on his shoulder to get a better look. Hurry up! We're risking suspension every minute we're down here. Hold your horses. I'm almost there. There. What'd I tell you? He swings open the door and looks back at Barclay. Okay, Ralph. You're up. Barclay steps into the phone closet. It's a small, dimly lit room with tangles of multicolored wires covering the walls. It's warm inside, and sweat beads on Barclay's neck. He runs his hands lightly over the cords, tracking their inputs and outputs. Outside the closet, one of the guys urges him on. Remember, Barkley, my entire relationship is riding on this. My girlfriend's going to break up with me if I don't call her more. In 1960, the phones are controlled by the monopolistic AT&T. During peak weekday hours, a long-distance call can cost as much as $2.25 for the first three minutes. That's close to 20 bucks in today's dollars. So free calls are nothing to sneeze at. Barkley finds the connections he's looking for. He takes the phone line for his friend Harry's room and plugs it into an output for a phone on the university's phone plan. He double checks his work, then nods. Okay, done. Let's go check it out. To test his hack, Barkley needs a payphone. If the payphone doesn't require more than a nickel to make a long distance call, he'll know that the operation is a success. It just so happens that his friend Harry has procured such a payphone through somewhat mysterious means and set it up in his dorm room for just that purpose. The boys run upstairs and pound on Harry's door. Harry, we did it. Let us in. Since Barkley was the one who figured out the free long distance trick, he gets the honor of making the first call. He drops a nickel into the payphone and dials his home number in the town of Soap Lake, 150 miles west. It's ringing. It's yes, we cool. did it. Barkley Residence. Shh, it's my sister. Hey, it's Ralph. Ralph, what are you doing calling? It's not Sunday. This is going to cost you a fortune. Don't worry about it. Ralph, what did you do? Nothing. I just wanted to say hi. Gotta go, sis. Ralph. He hangs up the phone, cutting her off. The payphone spits out the nickel, and Barkley holds it up in the air triumphantly. Gentlemen... We have free long distance. The boys go crazy. An engineering student, Barkley has been fascinated by electronics since he was four and first stuck a bobby pin into an outlet. He even started his own radio repair business when he was only 10. As much as he enjoys this victory over AT&T, he knows that it's not a perfect solution. The hall still shares one phone. It's inconvenient and privacy is non-existent. Plus, there's always the possibility that the university will discover what they've done. It's always been second nature to Barclay to figure out a better solution. And a few months later, he finds one. It's November 1960. Barclay sits in the engineering library, thumbing through a thick periodical entitled Bell System Technical Journal. 
It's published by Bell Labs, the research division of AT&T. He discovered it with his recent phone antics in mind and decided to check it out. One article in particular catches his eye. Signal Systems for Control of Telephone Switching. As he begins reading, his jaw drops. No way. This can't be what it looks like. Over 64 pages of dry, technical writing, the article explains that the entire phone system is controlled by tones of various frequencies. It carefully details which tones do what, and even includes schematics of the electrical circuits needed to generate those tones. For anyone patient enough to slog through the dense writing, it's basically an instruction manual for how to take over the phone system. As he reads, a grin spreads across Sparkly's face. If I can control the tones, I can control the phones. He takes out a notebook and scribbles down notes as fast as he can. It's Thanksgiving weekend, 1960. In his tiny hometown of Soap Lake, Washington, Barkley stands in front of a payphone on an abandoned street corner. He spent the entire long weekend building a four by four inch contraption containing a nine volt battery and an oscillator circuit. On top of the box, there's a button and a rotary phone dialer. If he's done it right, he should be able to make a free long distance call at any payphone in the country using only this small box. Barkley picks up the phone and dials the number for operator assistance, a toll-free call. Moving quickly, he holds his box up to the receiver and scrambles to push the button. He only has a few seconds. He has to push the button before the operator answers, but his hands slip. Operator, how may I direct your call? Barkley quickly hangs up. He takes a deep breath and tries again. This time he holds the box with his left hand, his thumb on the button, while he dials with his right hand. Before the first ring is complete, he squeezes down on the button, emitting a tone. Suddenly, the ringing stops. Barkley lifts his thumb off the button, stopping the tone. A metallic clunking noise comes through the line, then silence. His hands shaking, Barkley uses the rotary dialer on his box to dial his friend Harry's number in Spokane. The box emits a distinct tone for each number he dials. Come on. After the last number, he hears the sound he's hoping for. Ralph, is that you? Did it work? (laughs) Yeah, it's me. And guess what? I just took over the phone system with a tone. Barkley's victory whoops echo down the deserted streets of Soap Lake. He can't wait to figure out what else his box can do. How far can he call? The East Coast? Europe? For a college kid in 1960, To be able to call people hundreds, maybe thousands of miles away for free, it's intoxicating. Over the rest of the school year, Barkley works on improving his box. AT&T is in the process of upgrading to use a more sophisticated tonal system, and Barkley needs a box that can keep up. By the summer of 1961, he has one. The case he has on hand is blue, so he dubs his device the Blue Box. Over the summer, Barkley returns to Soap Lake and gets a job at a TV and radio repair shop in Afreda, the next town over. Nights and weekends, he learns what the blue box can do. Through a friend whose parents work for AT&T, he gets a hold of phone company manuals and devours them cover to cover. He chats with workers, servicing telephone lines, happy to talk to a curious teen. He learns codes that enable his box to dial England and other Western European countries. He doesn't know anyone to call in those places, but that doesn't matter. Frequently, he just calls automated numbers that tell him the local time wherever he's phoning. The point isn't to talk to anyone in particular, it's just to see what his box can do. To start with a toll-free call, Barkley usually begins by dialing directory assistance. In trying different numbers, he discovers that the directory assistance line in Alberta, Canada, does not have an operator manning it. Barkley worries that if he calls the same human operators too often, they might realize he was up to something fishy. So Alberta becomes his gateway to the world. Barkley knows what he's doing is technically illegal. And he knows the phone company employs security agents looking for people cheating on their bill. But he's always careful to call from different payphones to avoid detection. And anyway, he considers what he's doing to be pretty harmless. The thought that his blue box might get him in serious trouble never really crosses his mind. 
It's September 1961. Barkley is at work repairing a television. It's his last week at home before heading back to college. A colleague approaches him, a concerned look on his face. Ralph, a couple of men are up front asking for you. For me? Barkley works in the back of the shop and has almost no interaction with customers, so it's surprising that anyone would ask for him by name. But Barkley shrugs and wipes off his hands before walking out front. As he approaches the counter, he sees two tall men dressed in black suits. They turn when they hear Barkley's footsteps. Mr. Barkley, we're with the FBI. Will you come with us, please? Half an hour later, Barkley sits alone, heart racing, in a police interrogation room at the Afreda Courthouse. When the FBI agents enter, they've brought company, a sheriff's deputy and three men in plain clothes. From their angry expressions, Barkley guesses they probably work for AT&T. One of the FBI agents paces in front of him. Okay, Mr. Barkley, just tell us the name of the bookie you're working for and we're done here. Bookie? I don't know what you're talking about. Look, there's this directory assistance number in Alberta, Canada. Five months ago, it gets maybe 20 calls per month from this area. Now it's getting 10 times that. We picked up your friend and he told us all about your little blue box. So, just tell us. Why so many calls to Alberta? If it's not bookmaking, then what's the operation? Well, there's no operation. I just like calling to find out what time it is in various places. Things like that. Be real, Kit. Do you actually expect us to believe that? One of the AT&T agents clears his throat. throat) Uh, According to our records, he is telling the truth. Very few of the calls were to real people. The FBI agents exchanged looks. All right, just tell us where you got the information about how to build the box. I read it in the Bell System Technical Journal. AT&T published it. The FBI agent laughs. (laughs) Come on, kid. At least tell us a plausible lie. But another of the AT&T men interrupts. Uh, Actually, I I know what article he's referring to. It never occurred to us that a college kid would uh, read it. One of the FBI agents turns and gives the AT&T men a long, cold stare. You gotta be kidding me. AT&T confiscates Barkley's blue box, and he's charged with making a phone call without paying for it. The judge compares Barkley's antics to freezing water into the shape of nickels to trick payphones. In other words, just a childish prank. Barkley pleads guilty and receives a suspended sentence, the equivalent of a slap on the wrist. Barkley's phone manipulating days are over. But he's not the only one figuring out the secret to AT&T's system. Over the next 10 years, an entire subculture will form around mastering the art of the tones, with the blue box at its center. This community of tech-minded people will spread across the country, and eventually, one man will bring them all together. It's 1969. 26-year-old John Draper navigates the streets of San Jose, California in his VW van as he broadcasts through a radio transmitter he rigged to the van's roof. Sporting thick round glasses, a tie-dyed shirt, and hair past his ears, Draper has spent the last year since he left the Air Force exploring his more countercultural impulses. All right, San Jose, this is your friendly neighborhood DJ, JD. I hope you're liking what you're hearing. Obviously, we're not authorized by the FCC, but that's half the fun, right? When he was stationed in Maine, Draper started a pirate radio station that was shut down by the FCC. Now back home and living with his parents, he's taking classes at a local college and working as an engineering tech for National Semiconductor. He decided to make his latest pirate radio station mobile to better evade the FCC regulators. It's a fun project, but he's still restless. He longs for something more challenging. Draper parks the van in front of his parents' house. Well, that's the end of my time today. I actually built this radio transmitter, and this is its maiden voyage. If you heard this broadcast, give me a call and let me know where you're located. I'd love to know how far this baby's signal is traveling. My number is 555-8917. This is DJ JD signing off. The next day, Draper's phone rings. Draper hustles across the living room to answer. He's expecting a phone call from an old Air Force buddy. Johnson, is that you? There's a pause before a deep voice speaks. Uh, no, uh, 
my name's Danny Teresi. Oh, sorry, I think you have the wrong number. No, 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 wait. Did you broadcast a radio signal yesterday? Yes, you heard that? Yep. Did you really build that transmitter? Yeah, it's a hobby of mine. That's cool. I'm a big radio guy myself. I actually did a signal report for you so you can know how strong I was picking it up if you're interested. Yes, please. Since he's been out of the Air Force, Draper's rarely found anyone who can go toe-to-toe with him on technical subjects. But the man on the other end of the phone feels like a kindred spirit. At the end of the conversation, Terezi gives Draper his number if he wants to chat again. A week later, Draper calls Terezi's number. But instead of ringing, he hears an unusual tone. That's weird. He hangs up and calls the operator. Director of Assistance, how may I help you? Uh, yeah, hi. Can you please connect me to 408-555-5799? There's a long, uncomfortable pause. Where did you get that number, sir? A friend gave it to me. Is there a problem? That is an internal number only. Draper starts to pace. Why had Terezi given him that number? He's certain he wrote it down correctly. Maybe Terezi works for the phone company? When Terezi calls Draper a few days later, Draper bombards him with questions. It turns out that the number Terezi gave him is used by AT&T technicians to test the signal when they're working on the lines. It's one half of what's called a loop around. If Terezi had called the other half, they could have chatted and never been billed. Draper is a little confused, but also intrigued. He's never thought about the phones much before, but he loves a puzzle. And the way Terezi is describing it, the phone system sounds like a puzzle on a grand scale. Terezi invites him to meet at a friend's house to learn more. A few days later, in another part of San Jose, Draper rings the doorbell of a small Spanish-style house. Terezi told him it belongs to his friend Jim Fetgather. The door swings open, revealing a middle-aged man in a polo shirt. Draper gives him a friendly grin. Are you Jim? The man remains stone-faced and shakes his head. The boys are upstairs. First door on your left. Now Draper's really confused, but he nods and silently enters the house. Draper walks up the stairs, but as he approaches the first doorway on the left, he slows down. It's completely dark inside the room. Maybe he misheard? He thinks about going back downstairs when a familiar voice from inside the room calls out. Hey, John, is that you? Come on in. Draper steps into the darkened doorway. Denny, why do you have the lights off? Another voice, higher than Terezi's, pipes up. You can turn them on if you want. When Draper turns on the light, he's surprised to see two teenage boys in sunglasses. One, sitting on the bed, is tall with dark hair and dressed like a cowboy. The other is smaller, dressed in jeans and a button-down shirt, sitting next to a high-end electric piano keyboard. There are no posters or other decorations on the wall, but the shelves are filled with records and books. Looking closer, Draper realizes that all the book's titles are in Braille. The teen in the cowboy gear grins. So which are you more surprised by? That I'm a teenager or that I'm blind? Draper recognizes his voice as Terezi's. Well, both, to be honest. Your voice sounds like you're in your 30s. Thanks, I guess. Anyway, enough chit-chat. You said you can make long-distance calls for free. I want to see how. Terezi laughs and turns to Fett Gather. What I tell you, this guy is all business. All right, John, give us a number you want to call. The farther away, the better. Draper gives them the number for a friend in New York. Fett Gather swivels in his chair and dials a toll-free 1-800 number. As soon as the phone rings, he plays a high, piercing note on his keyboard. The phone stops ringing with a chirp, followed by a loud hiss. Draper watches intently. What's he doing? Shh, just listen. Quickly, Fetgather plays more notes into the phone. He listens for a moment, then he hands the receiver to Draper. Hello? Bob, it's me, John. Oh, hey, John. Didn't expect to hear from you on a random Wednesday. Well, you might be hearing from me a lot more often. What do you mean? Gotta run. I'll call you later. But... He hangs up the phone and turns to the two grinning teenagers. You're positive your parents aren't going to be charged for that. Nope. As far as the phone company is concerned, we've been on a toll-free call with a rental car company in Los Angeles this entire time. Draper's mind swirls with the infinite possibilities this opens up. Okay, explain everything to me. Teresi and Fetgather tell Draper about another blind kid that they've heard about named Joseph Ingressia Jr. 
and Gracia has perfect pitch. While sitting on a long-distance call when he was just seven years old, he unconsciously whistled a tone that he could hear in the background. And so that's the same note I just played. It's a high E note, what's called an E7. And this seven-year-old kid figured out that the phone system was controlled by tones, and he could make those tones with his mouth. Draper is like a little kid with a new toy. He can't wait to try more numbers. I got some friends stationed overseas. Can we call them? But Terezi looks reluctant. If we make too many calls from our home phones, we run the risk of raising red flags with AT&T security. Although, there might be a way around that. Draper perks up. How? Terezi and Fettgather explain about blue boxes. Over the years, other people besides Barclay have figured out how to build them, but they remain elusive. They require access to the proper tools and sharp engineering skills to get the frequencies just right. If we had a blue box, we could make calls for hours on end from payphones. By the time AT&T realized what was happening, we'd be long gone. Draper's engineering mind is in overdrive. This is the kind of project he's been longing for. So how many frequencies does the box need to generate? 11. The takeover tone and the tones for each number. And you know what each of these frequencies are? Both Fettgather and Terezi nod. I can make one. Fettgather and Terezi grin. This is exactly what they wanted Draper to say. Draper gets started that same day. He rummages through his bin of spare parts, breaks out his slide rule, and runs between his parents' piano and his workbench, making sure he's generating the correct frequencies. Within 45 minutes, he has it. A working blue box. But more than that, he has a newfound obsession with the phone system. He learns how to play it like a musical instrument. He can speak into a phone in his left hand, bounce the call from tower to tower all around the world, and hear his voice 30 seconds later coming through a phone in his right hand. He calls the American embassy in Moscow, payphones in London, finds out the time in Ecuador. There's no point to it, necessarily. He's just compelled to see what he can do, how he can manipulate a system he sees as beautiful. A few months later, he makes a discovery that will change phone hacking forever. It's 1970. Draper waits impatiently for Terezi to answer his phone, fidgeting with the cord. He's discovered something today that he thinks could be a game changer, but he can't test it by himself. Finally, Teresi answers. Hello? Denny, Denny, it's me. As soon as we're off the phone, I want you to call that Vancouver exchange I told you about. It'll sound like the line goes dead, but stay on. Wait at least five minutes before you hang up. I have a theory. Roger that. Draper hangs up and calls Fettgather, repeating his instructions. Then he dials the number he told Terezi and Fettgather to call. Right away, he hears his friends chatting. Have you talked to Denise, the operator in Phoenix? His voice like butter. I don't think I've talked to her. I, I'm a big fan of Carol and Austin. Draper interrupts. Boo! <gasps> Terezi and Fettgather both gasp, surprised. John, you're here. And Jimmy? Yeah, yeah I'm still here. Wait, so we have three people all talking to each other. On his end of the phone, Draper grins widely. We have ourselves a free conference line, boys. On phones in 1970, talking to multiple people at once is virtually unheard of. Conference lines are extremely expensive and only used by huge corporations. To have a number that three people can call into for free is an incredible discovery. But Draper is just getting started. You guys want to find out how many people we can have on the line at once? Yes. Hello, this is Bill from Los Angeles. Am I in the right place? Anyone there? Joey from the Bronx. Soon, a rotating cast of roughly 50 phone enthusiasts are regularly meeting on the conference line. They come from all over the country. About half of them are blind. Almost all of them are male. The conference line becomes a place for people with an obscure interest to gather, exchange information, and find community. Callers exchange advice on how to build blue boxes, and some start selling them to others who don't have the technical skills to build their own. Eventually, this community gives itself a name. They call themselves Phone Freaks, spelled with a PH. And as their community grows, it begins to attract some unwelcome attention. It's 1971. John Draper is sitting at home eating dinner when his phone rings. Hello? 
Is this Captain Crunch? Draper pauses. Captain Crunch is the name he goes by on the conference lines. AT&T has gotten better at identifying people manipulating their system, so almost all of the phone freaks use aliases. Draper's is an homage to a free toy whistle that came in boxes of Captain Crunch cereal, a whistle that coincidentally emits the same E7 note he and other freaks use to make free calls. Uh, who's calling? My name is Ron Rosenbaum. I'm a reporter with Esquire magazine. I'm doing a story on phone freaks, and I've been told you're kind of the leader of the group, that your skills are legendary. Draper's stomach drops. He's heard rumors from the other phone freaks that a reporter was sniffing around. Many of the younger freaks are happy for the media attention. But Draper knows it could lead to a crackdown from AT&T. He decides to play hardball, hoping he can convince the reporter to drop the story. This is not an article you should be writing. Oh yeah? Uh, why not? Because this is not information that should get into the hands of the wrong people. What kind of information are we talking about? What would you say if I told you it's possible for three phone freaks to saturate the phone system of the nation? Saturate it. Busy signals for everyone. Just three people? How is that possible? Why can't this reporter take a hint? Now Draper is getting agitated. I'm not going to tell you. But trust me, it is very possible. Or what about this? These younger phone freaks, they call Moscow all the time. What if you publish this article and all sorts of other people start calling Moscow? I don't want the Soviets dropping a bomb on my head because you let this information get into the wrong hands. So I'm telling you, don't write this article. I will take that under advisement. Draper's attempt to scare off the reporter backfires. In October 1971, Esquire runs an article titled Secrets of the Little Blue Box. It makes an immediate splash. Phone freaking becomes the hot new thing. Lots of people see the phone freaks as heroes, pulling one over on a monopolistic company that overcharges for its service. Suddenly, even non-tech-minded people want a blue box to see what they can do with their phones. In the past, AT&T declined to pursue charges against phone freaks. They knew that every arrest meant another article in the local press, which just drew more attention to their system's vulnerabilities. But the Esquire article forces their hand. For them, the phone freaks are a profound embarrassment, one that has to be stopped. In 1970, only six people were arrested for toll fraud, the crime of making phone calls and not paying for them. In 1971, the year of the Esquire article, that number rose to 45 including many of Draper's friends from the conference lines. Just owning a blue box, let alone using one, is now a federal crime. Draper is more careful than many of his fellow phone freaks. For a while, he manages to evade the authorities. But it's only a matter of time before his luck runs out. It's May 1972, San Jose, California. John Draper is driving in his VW van on his way to work as a radio engineer for a station in nearby Cupertino. He beats his hands on the steering wheel in time with the music. A siren blares behind him. He looks in his rearview mirror and sees an unmarked car with a single light on its roof flashing its lights at him. Damn it. He pulls into a parking lot and waits for the inevitable. Mr. Draper, I'm with the FBI. Can you step out of the van, please? There's no point fighting it. Draper opens the door and steps out, holding out his wrists to be handcuffed. John Draper, you are under arrest for toll fraud. We have a warrant to search your vehicle. John Draper gets sentenced to five years probation for toll fraud. In later years, he tries to go legit, working for Apple and IBM. But his life is a troubled one. In 1976, he gets arrested again and does time in federal prison for toll fraud and parole violations. And in 2017, he's banned from hacker conferences after multiple men accuse him of sexual assault. Still, his early exploits as Captain Crunch remain legendary among hackers and phone freaks. Despite the risk of arrest, phone freaking doesn't go away. It continues to be irresistible to those driven by their need to learn and manipulate systems. Even blue boxes stay in circulation. Among those who learn how to build them are two engineering students named Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. A few years later, their interest in phone freaking leads them to try building a new device, a personal computer. But for most phone freaks, computers are still a long way away. 
And for a younger generation, even phone freaking is still a brand new, mind-blowing concept. It's summer 1976, Los Angeles, California. 13-year-old Kevin Mitnick steps onto a bus on his way to the nearby Magic Store. He hands over his transfer ticket, but before he can head for his seat, the driver calls out to him. Hey! Mitnick freezes. His transfer ticket is a fake, made with his own punch machine and old transfer books salvaged from a dumpster outside the bus depot. He uses them to ride the bus all day during the summer for free. But now, he figures, the jig is up. The bus driver nods at Mitnick's shirt that says, CBers do it over the air. You into radios? So that's why the driver stopped him. Mitnick quietly breathes a sigh of relief. Yeah, they're pretty cool. I just bought a Motorola handheld radio. It used to be a police radio. Really? So you can listen to the police frequencies? No, I wish. But you know what you can do on a ham radio that you can't do on a CB? Broadcast further and at more frequencies. Well, that, but also make free phone calls. Really? Uh Uh-huh. Like, totally free? Yep. If you know how. It's not something everyone knows how to do. Mitnick is immediately intrigued. Activities that not everyone knows how to do are kind of his thing. The idea of tricking the phone company appeals to him, the same way that Magic does, or making his own transfer tickets. At 13, Mitnick starts working towards getting his ham radio license. Bus transfers, ham radios, and phone freaking will be the tip of the iceberg for Mitnick. Soon, he learns about another powerful tool that he can use to beat the systems designed to keep him out. It's 1978, Monroe High School in the San Fernando Valley, north of Los Angeles. Kevin Mitnick, now 14, sits in the back of the computer lab. Despite not having the math or science prerequisites needed to take the computer class, Mitnick talked his way into it. He's a relatively quiet kid, but also a persuasive salesman. At the front of the classroom, the teacher asks a question. So who can tell me what a compiler does? Mitnick looks down and notices a phone line running into his computer. He shoots his hand in the air. The teacher calls on him. Kevin, do you know what a compiler does? Uh, no, but I have a question. Are these computers connected to the phones? Uh, It's a little off topic, but yes, they have what are known as modems. They can use them to talk to other computers. Mitnick's eyes light up. So with this computer, I could talk to a computer at USC, for example, and play some of the video games they have there. The teacher nods. Theoretically, yes, but the phone lines in this room can only call phone lines within our school district. You wouldn't be able to get through to USC. With a smirk, Mitnick thinks... We'll just see about that. Within days, Mitnick has used his phone-freaking skills to get an outside line and obtain access to USC's computers. The games he plays are fun, but being on a computer he's not supposed to be on is downright thrilling. Kevin Mitnick is an unathletic, nerdy kid attending a big sports-centric high school. Hacking makes him feel powerful. And once he gets a taste, it's virtually impossible for him to stop. Soon, he's breaking into whatever computers he can, stealing passwords, and seeing just how far he can go. His antics will straddle the line between harmless prank and dangerous crime, changing what it means to be a hacker forever. On our next episode, as Kevin Mitnick gets deeper into computer hacking, a friend's betrayal leads to his arrest. And when he decides to go on the lam, Mitnick gets a new nickname, the John Dillinger of Cyberspace. From Wondery, this is episode one of Hacking on American Innovations. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review. And be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. And to listen to episodes one week early, join Wondery Plus. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey. And tell us which innovation stories you'd like to hear. A quick note about the recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations. But they're based on historical research. If you want to learn more about the history of phone freaks, we recommend Exploding the Phone, 
the untold story of the teenagers and outlaws who hacked Ma Bell by Phil Lapsley. And there's also the classic Stephen Levy book, Hackers. American Innovations is hosted by me, Stephen Johnson. For more information on my books and television series about science and innovation, including my new one, book and PBS series, Extra Life, A Short History of Living Longer, you can visit my website at stephenberlinjohnson.com or follow me on Twitter at Stephen B. Johnson. Sound design on this episode is by Jason Freeman. This episode was written by Austin Rackless, with editing by Matt Almos. Produced by Andy Herman. Executive produced by Jenny Lauer-Beckman, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.